Good morning, everyone. It gives me great pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Kurt Jacobson, Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine. Dr. Jacobson went to medical school at the University of Kansas. He did his residency in internal medicine at Mayo, and then he came here to UW Medicine to do his fellowship in cardiovascular medicine and interventional cardiology. After finishing his training, he went to private practice for one year in Montana, and then was recruited back to UW as an assistant professor on the CHS track. In 2020, he was promoted to associate professor. Since his arrival, Dr. Jacobson has distinguished himself as a leader in program building. One of the first programs that he built was the UW hybrid coronary vascularization program. Together with our surgical colleagues, Dr. Jacobson developed a new strategy to treat symptomatic patients with multivessel coronary artery disease using a combination of percutaneous interventions and minimally invasive robotic techniques, avoiding full open chest operations in many patients. Dr. Jacobson and our surgeons were the first in the region to offer this technique. His success resulted in us being selected as one of the national sites for the NHLBI-sponsored multicenter hybrid trial, randomizing patients to the hybrid strategy versus multivessel PCI. Other programs that he helped uh, develop include the Watchman program for stroke prevention in patients with AFib. As you know, the Watchman device is approved for patients who have AFib who are at risk of having stroke but are not candidates for long-term anticoagulation. The Structural Heart and Transcatheter Valve Replacement Program is another program where his contributions have been very important. In addition to doing the TAVR procedure, Dr. Jacobson performed the first transcatheter mitral valve and valve replacement at UW. This is a novel approach to treating patients with failing mitral bioprosthesis who would otherwise be high risk for traditional redo cardiac surgery. And of course, his signature program, the Pulmonary Embolism Response Team, the PERT program that he's going to be discussing today. The PERT program was designed to provide rapid assessment and guidance on the management of patients with PE, in specific help identify patients who may benefit from advanced therapy. Dr. Jacobson gave several CME and outreach talks about the PERT program throughout UW Health and the region, and UW now has become a member of the National PERT Consortium led by NGH. In addition to being a leader, Kurt also has been heavily involved in education. He's a member of the CDM Fellowship Education Committee, and in 2017, he was appointed as the program director for our Interventional Cardiology Fellowship. Over a very short period of time, he revamped the cardiac cath curriculum and didactic series. He redesigned the evaluation and feedback process, and he revised the goals and objectives for the fellowship year. Dr. Jacobson is a gifted teacher, and he's able to reach learners at all levels from medical students to peers. He's also involved in research and he's been a great citizen. He has co-authored eight manuscripts and two book chapters. He's the site PI or PI on many clinical trials. He's a member of the American College of Cardiology, Society for Cardiovascular and Geography and Interventions, and the National Bird Consortium. Today, he's gonna to be talking about his favorite topic, how to manage EP, a BE and a specific uh, the PERT program, the title of his talk is Calling the Experts an Evolving Approach in Managing Major Pulmonary Embolism. Dr. Jacobson, thank you for joining us and you can go thank ahead you and so your slides. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Dr. Hamdan. That was a wonderful introduction. I really appreciate that. Very kind. So um, in the interest of time, I'd like to go ahead and move towards my talk. Uh, the, let's see here. Okay. Uh, I think you can review the objectives here, and I certainly have no uh, conflicts of interest in giving this talk other than I'm an interventional cardiologist, and maybe I'm, I have some intrinsic biases, but nonetheless, uh, I think you'll find that the PER program helps to eliminate some of those biases by having a multidisciplinary approach to management of PE. This is just a brief outline of my goals and objectives for this talk, and if we can get to these in a timely manner, I'd like to share a few cases with you as well. It's important to understand the overall burden of pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism remains very common. It's estimated to be at least one per thousand. Of course, this is all comers being low, intermediate, or high risk PE patients. I do think this is an ultimately an underestimate as this statistic has not changed in over two decades. Now, that said, most are gonna be low risk, but I think that paradigm is also changing. Historically, the incidence of major PE is about one in 10, but based on some 
additional information, which I'm going to go over, I, I think I can convince you that this is actually an underestimate and that we're seeing more high risk patients than we think. And despite advances in PE related care, PE, uh, more PE remains the third leading cause of cardiovascular death. And it's held that honorable title for about two decades despite these advances. Importantly, of fatal PE, two thirds will die within the first hour of presentation. And nine out of 10 patients will die within the first three hours of presentation. 70% of fatal PE are not actually diagnosed until post-mortem. So there is, a, there is a time commitment here to managing patients with PE. Despite education, advances in VTE prophylaxis, quality measures, and probably reflective of the growing obesity epidemic and amongst other evolving risk factors, hospitalization for PE is increasing. And based on administrative data from the AHA Heart Disease and Stroke Statistics update, uh, PE admissions have increased from about 23 per 100,000 to 65 per 100,000. So more than a two-fold increase in this two-decade time period. And during that same two-decade time period, we've seen some, trend, some concerning changes in the trends in terms of age-adjusted PE mortality. That up until about 2011, uh, we were reassured by a steady decline in PE-related mortality. However, at some point between 2012 and 2013, this trend has changed and altered course. And we're now seeing again an upslope in terms of age-adjusted PE mortality. Despite, in addition to this concerning trend, a number of disparities are also quite prevalent. And that is despite the highest annual percent change in terms of age-adjusted mortality being in white men and white women, um, black men and black women continue to have a two-fold increase in age-adjusted mortality. And it's not just racial disparities that we're seeing, also depends on where you live. If you live in the South versus the North, you have a two-fold increased risk of mortality. If you live in rural, rural America versus urban America, about a one and a half, two-fold increase in age-adjusted in, uh, age PE mortality. So significant disparities exist and persist uh, despite advances in PE-related care. And it's true that not all PE are the same based on whatever registry you choose to look at. In this case, the MAPA registry, which is over 1,000 patients. PE-related mortality is about 20, major PE-related mortality is about 22%. But this in perspective, low-risk PE carries a mortality of generally less than 1 to 1.1%. Now, major PE is, a, is basically a collection of all non-low-risk PE. And this mortality is probably influenced mostly by the higher-risk patients, those who present with shock, CPR, or ongoing hypotension. They have mortalities that are very comparable to what we see in patients who have complicated STEMIs or right ventricular infarcts, with mortalities up as high as 65%. But even patients who present looking relatively stable or hemodynamically normal carry with them an increased risk of mortality comparable to that of a high-risk non-STEMI at about 8%. At transient low blood pressure, their mortality can double fairly quickly. What am I talking about when I'm saying major PE or high-risk PE? Well, major PE is really not a, a, a great descriptor in clinical medicine. It's more of an academic term, but it's just a way of kind of lumping all PEs that are not low risk. Essentially, these are patients, of, or these are patients with PE that have some combination of embolic size or cardiopulmonary dysfunction that results in a clinically significant event. But universally, they, have, they all have underlying right ventricular dysfunction. What we're trying to do is move away from that anatomic description of PE, such as massive and submassive, and use more of a risk stratifying term that helps us identify patients who are at risk from complications of their PE. High-risk PE now takes place of massive. The primary criterion for this definition is that they present hypotensive with evidence of end organ hypoperfusion with underlying acute right ventricular failure. Intermediate risk PE, this tends to be the population that is the most debatable in terms of how to manage. They're also the most difficult to discern. This within here is a spectrum that can range from high intermediate to low intermediate risk, with very, difference, very large differences in outcomes. But they are defined by having relative hemodynamic stability when they present yet underlying acute right ventricular dysfunction. So the question is, what influences these mortality differences? It's this relationship of severity and mortality that has us debating the best way to manage many of these patients. A minimal increase in severity can produce shock or cardiac arrest or even sudden death and carry with it a very high mortality. So what combination of embolus size or cardiopulmonary status 
produces this mortality compromise. This is the, this is the uh, question and the concern. This eludes us to this day. It turns out that perhaps right ventricular function might be our canary in the coal mine and helping us understand those patients who are truly at risk of further deterioration or complication or those who will ultimately do very well. And then over 20 years ago, investigators identified a concerning trend in patients with major PE. In the International Cooperative PE Registry, they found that patients who presented with any degree of right ventricular hypokinesis or dysfunction had a significantly higher mortality rate. And this mortality curve continued out to three months from their hospitalization. What is it about the right ventricle that makes it the potential canary in the coal mine? Why is it so much more vulnerable? Well, normally the pulmonary circulation is a low resistance, high capacitance system that's capable of accommodating about a three to four fold increase in right ventricular stroke volume without raising pulmonary pressures. The right ventricle is the thinner walled muscular crescent shaped chamber that most, with most of its myocardial fibers arranged in series. It cannot tolerate the sudden increase in stress of wall tension produced by a sudden big PE that creates high pulmonary pressures without a sudden decline in stroke volume and subsequent cardiac output. Whereas its muscular neighbor, the left ventricle, which has myocardial fibers arranged more in parallel, is more concentric shaped, is capable of withstanding much higher degrees of afterload before decompensating. Once you have this large PE that leads to this anatomic destruction, which ultimately also leads to an increase in stress catecholamines, PA pressures rise because of this large increase in impedance that begets the right ventricular dysfunction. This become a very vicious pathophysiologic cycle that can beget worse outcomes. Uh, sudden drop in cardiac output or increase in right ventricular volume because of volume and pressure overload. These constraints within a fixed pericardial space that ultimately compromises left ventricular filling, reducing cardiac output, mean arterial pressure, begetting more RV ischemia. You can see how this process can viciously deteriorate. And without means of trying to interrupt this process, either by treating the clot burden directly or providing right ventricular support, patients can deteriorate and have adverse outcomes. So it's important that we identify tools that help us risk stratify and try to understand which patients may benefit from earlier, more advanced treatments than simply watching and waiting. Or identifying those patients who will do well and can undergo conservative management with greater confidence. One of the earliest tools that we've used and identified is that which we can derive simply from a diagnostic test of choice, which has ubiquitous availability in the current day, and that's the chest CT scan. Dating back almost 17 years ago, investigators identified some fairly simple parameters that can readily identify patients who would be at increased risk of adverse outcomes with PE. The simple measurements in this four-team review of looking what's happened to the right ventricle relative to the left ventricle. And a right ventricle to LB uh, to diameter ratio greater than 0.9 in this series of over 400 patients turned out to be a fairly significant predictor of 30-day death with about a five-fold increased risk. Outcomes that surpass that of other complicating comorbidities that often are associated with increased risk, such as pneumonia, cancer, chronic lung disease, and even age. And it does so with a very high sensitivity, a strong negative predictive value, but sadly, a low positive predictive value. Multiple studies have investigated this further in hopes of identifying uh, maybe better predictive values. Again, in this series of over 260 patients, a four-chamber RBW diameter ratio greater than one, again, a sensitive predictor for 30-day death, but again, low specificity and ultimately low positive predictive value, but again, high negative predictive values. But it turns out if we combine some additional CT parameters with this finding, such as substantial IBC reflux, that is contrast that's visible in the IVC below the level of the infrahepatic veins um, may increase our ability to predict those patients who are gonna to succumb to additional complications such as mortality, but also decompensation. And maybe we can identify those who would benefit from earlier treatment or more advanced treatments, even if they appear hemodynamically stable. Troponins are ubiquitously available as well, and you'd be hard pressed to find a study that doesn't look at troponins and find that there's an increased risk of adverse outcomes if they're elevated. Everything from pneumonia, sepsis, of course, MI, but P not excluded. And in this large meta-analysis of all the available studies, which has about 2,000 patients, they found that elevated troponin strongly correlated with an increase in risk of mortality, about a five-fold increased short-term mortality risk. Now that said, 
wide confidence intervals in these studies makes using troponin alone inappropriate as a risk stratifier out of context of other clinical features. Even less is known about high sensitivity troponins. Uh, we don't really know how to use them at this point in time. So uh, I think we have to be very cautious when we interpret high sensitivity troponins, it may lead to overestimation of risk. But what is also true is that a negative troponin or normal troponin is not an adequate predictor of low risk and should not be used to identify low risk patients. Myocardial wall stress is a potent stimulus for the increased synthesis and secretion of BNP, which gives the biological plausibility for elevation of BNP and NT bro BNP in the setting of acute PE and right ventricular strain. And in this meta analysis of multiple studies found that using the reference standard of transthoracic echo to assess right ventricular function, elevated BNP strongly correlates with right ventricular dysfunction. The very high diagnostic accuracy the C statistic that exceeds 0.9, so excellent performer. Problem is, is that other things can cause BNP elevations, including diastolic heart failure, kidney failure, chronic LV dysfunction, et cetera. But in this study, in addition to strongly correlating with the presence of right ventricular dysfunction, also concordant findings of increased risk of all cause in hospital or short-term mortality with certain cutoffs of pro-BNP or standard BNP. EKG actually may have a role in PE, but not for diagnosis. So PE or EKGs are not diagnostic for PE, although it can be said, and it's safe to assume that most ECGs are not normal in patients who present with PE. In fact, less than one in five ECGs are normal in patients who present with PE. Most findings are the S1, Q3, T3, Q3, T3 pattern that I show here, which is a more of a fascinoma, or the right bundle branch block or the rabbit ear finding and V1, V2 being very common findings. Now that said, multiple series have now shown that presence of precordial T-wave inversions are suggestive of more severe PE and can be prognostic. High-risk patients universally have precordial T-wave inversions, and even intermittent risk patients, one in five, may have precordial T-wave inversions. And these T-waves, uh, T-wave reversibility actually correlates with physiologic improvement after treatment with advanced therapies. So these T waves do resolve, much like ST segment changes improve after we revascularize coronary vessels in the setting of ischemic heart disease. And the more T wave inversions you have, the greater the risk of adverse outcome. Less than three, probably low risk of adverse outcomes. More than six, high risk of adverse outcomes. But again, all of these different risk stratifying tools that we're looking at are really surrogates for what's happening to the right ventricle. And really the standard of care for looking at what's happening to the right ventricle in an acute setting is, a, is trans thoracic echocardiogram. Somebody out there is probably thinking about cardiac MRI being the gold standard for right ventricular function. And that's true, but not as widely available as echo, uh, specifically in acute, especially in acute PE settings. And this is an example of a patient with severe right ventricular dysfunction with basal to mid anterior uh, RV wall hypokinesis, virtually akinesis, and the classical McConnell sign or the apical wink that is often symbolic of acute PE in a slightly underfilled hyperdynamic left ventricle. And multiple prospective studies have correlated reduced RV function by echo as a predictor of adverse outcomes. In this 200 patient uh, series, a very uh, specific finding was observed in that no patients with normal RV function died from PE. This is an important finding. If you have a normal right ventricle, uh, normal right ventricular function with PE, your outcomes are likely to be very good, at least from the PE perspective. However, despite many of them presenting with normal blood pressure, over a third had underlying acute right ventricular dysfunction. And it's in this population that ultimately PE-related shock and in mortality occurred. And in a subsequent series of patients prospectively identified, they found that moderate or greater right ventricular dysfunction by echo was the most powerful predictor of in-hospital death with about a six-fold increased risk. So again, supporting the concept that the right ventricle may be our canary in the coal mine. ECHO has the ability to give us additional parameters to assess what's happening to myocardial performance beyond that of just 2D imaging, such as looking at right ventricular function. And that includes using tools that help assess blood flow, in this case, the LVOT velocity time integral, which is simply uh, some of the echocardiography are probably going to cringe the way I describe it, but essentially it's a is a summation of, of flow velocities through a fixed orifice, in this case, the LVOT. And we can use some fairly simple mathematics knowing the LVOT diameter, to get a bit cross-sectional area. And we can turn this number 
into a stroke volume and just knowing the heart rate, we can estimate cardiac output. But it turns out that we can do that fairly simply with uh, software packages that are embedded in any contemporary EPA device fairly quickly and easily and give ourselves a surrogate for what's happening in terms of flow. But it turns out an LVOT VTI less than 15 strongly correlates with increased risk of in-hospital mortality and cardiac arrest, but also shock or need for reperfusion therapies. And not surprisingly, similar findings using the RVOT VTI, which is simply the right ventricular outflow tract as opposed to the left ventricular outflow tract, using very similar parameters and calculations, found that an RVOT VTI less than nine and a half has about a tenfold increased risk of PE-related death. To hold the male, perhaps they're not as predictive as we thought. And in this large series of patients out of the Cleveland Clinic, uh, has a very robust PE experience and a large treatment population, attempted to identify some additional risk stratifying tools to identify those who may benefit from advanced therapies. And in this study, the primary composite outcome was the uh, need for advanced reperfusion therapies, cardiac arrest, or in-hospital mortality. And they found that the strongest predictor was actually this index of pulmonary systolic pressure to LV stroke volume greater than one. This is a very similar parameter to what we use in the cath lab when we see patients who present with uh, complicated MIs and were looking a bit shocky. It helps us determine those who may benefit from left ventricular support or right ventricular support devices uh, to improve blood flow. And it turns out this is actually a stronger predictor than LVOT VTI or RVOT VTI. And actually it's probably a stronger performer than some of the more well-validated risk scores. But when you look at the C statistic or the area under the curve here, the predictive ability is quite modest. The AUC is running about 0.6, far less than 0.7. So marginal discriminatory ability. So probably not really ready for prime time, probably not ready for using to predict and uh, make treatment decisions in and alone or in and by themselves. Probably best used in context of other clinical variables or in expert discussion. What about risk scores? Well, risk scores try to incorporate many of these other features to try to come up with some kind of summation to help us understand those patients who are at greatest risk and, and help guide therapy. These are the most well-validated. Last time I looked, there's at least 16 different risk scores. Most are not well-validated and it's hard to keep up with those there are. Um, the one that is most well-validated is the pulmonary embolism severity index. We like the simplified version because, well, it's simplified. There's only six different parameters that we have to keep in mind. And even better, we only need to know one score. And that is, if you have one or higher for simplified PESI, your mortality rate is high enough to say that you're not low risk. If your score is zero, you're low risk, and the odds of having a good outcome are very high. Unfortunately, none of these risk scores turn out to be very predictive in, in high-risk patient populations. And in this uh, cohort analysis using the PERT Consortium Registry, these are again, high-risk patients who were evaluated and treated in PERT centers across the nation. They've found that uh, the PESI, SPESI, BOVA, or European risk scores were not particularly strong discriminators in terms of identifying those who would be at increased risk of mortality within one week or 30 days. Now, maybe I'm being a little facetious here. I think it's a little bit better than a coin flip, but it turns out a coin flip is not 50-50. And in fact, depending on the weighting of the coin or which side is facing up, the odds are more like 51 to 49 if you choose to face up uh, in terms of your call. So marginally better than a coin flip here and probably not ready to, make, to be utilized uh, for clinical decision making in and of themselves. So keeping in mind our ability to risk stratify patients, those limitations, what are our treatment options and how, how do we incorporate them into our practice? Well, the gold standard and the remaining standard of care, the current standard of care for treatment of QP remains heparin, or maybe more contemporary, it's low molecular weight heparin. This was first identified going back to 1960 with one of the earliest randomized clinical trials published in The Lancet uh, and one of the earliest results of evidence-based medicine. In this population, they took uh, 35 suspected cases of pulmonary embolism. Again, they did not have CT scans. These were largely clinical suspicion and randomized them to be treated with heparin or placebo. This is the only true placebo randomized trial for the use of heparin uh, in patients with PE. In the untreated arm, there were five deaths early on and with interim analysis, they identified this as being statistically significant and no further patients were randomized and all subsequent patients were treated with heparin and no further deaths were observed. So this established heparin as the gold standard uh, for treatment of PE 
and it remains the gold standard to this day, or at least low molecular weight heparin may be the gold standard now. And it turns out timing is very important in terms of when we administer anticoagulation. And this observational series from Mayo Clinic back in 2010 established that in patients with the suspected PE, treatment early on can provide significant improvements in outcomes. In fact, hospital mortality was significantly lower in patients who received their heparin in the emergency department before admission. Investigations have gone on to show that if you um, treat patients with heparin that have a high pretest probability or even intermediate pretest probability of PE before confirmatory testing, uh, outcomes were also improved. So timing of heparin is very, very important and should be given very early, even before confirmatory testing in those patients who are low bleed risk with an intermediate or high pretest probability. And it turns out maybe it's even less important that it's therapeutic uh, so much as that it's given early, although there was a trend in terms of better outcomes in those patients who received therapeutic heparin as determined by PTT within the first 24 hours. What about thrombolytics? Thrombolytics have a long storied history in evaluating uh, outcomes with PE or treating patients with PE. Uh, one of the, the first meta-analysis of the early uh, 11 randomized trials, which included uh, use of streptokinase, urokinase, variations of TPA, treated about 750 patients with acute PE. Now this was all comers. These were low risk and intermediate risk PEs, not really many high risk PEs in this population. They looked at primary efficacy outcome of recurrent PE or death, and then a number of safety outcomes, including bleeding, but also intracranial bleeding. And while there were some numerical differences that seemed to be in favor of giving thrombolytics, these numerical differences did not reach statistical significance, except in bleeding. Patients who received thrombolytics had a significantly increased risk of major and non-major or clinically significant bleeding. However, when you exclude the low risk patients from this population and only look at those who were going to intermediate risk, again, presence of right ventricular dysfunction or pulmonary hypertension, in addition to other clinical variables, they found that there was a mortality benefit and about number needed to treat of 10. So every 10, you may prevent one mortality. However, in this population, very high risk of bleeding. So for every 10 you treat to save a life, you end up with a major or severe bleeding complication. Number, quite a bit of heterogeneity in this population in terms of lytic regimens, the bleeding definitions used, outcomes followed, but also heparin dosing makes it hard to apply this study uh, and broadly and to use it in treating intermediate risk patients, which is why uh, this did influence guidelines to promote using lytics for massive PE, or at that time, massive PE, what we call high risk PE, but did not recommend it for intermediate risk PE for obvious reasons with a number of safety concerns. But that data is quite antiquated and quite heterogeneous. We actually have the PYTHO study, which is a contemporary analysis of using tenecteplase versus heparin um, in a randomized double-blind trial with over 1,000 patients. This one study essentially trumps all other lytic trials to date because it's the largest, most well-powered to look at outcomes. Patients for this study had to have right ventricular dysfunction by echo or CT as well as positive biomarkers. So true intermediate risk patients, but they were hemodynamically stable, meaning they excluded hypotensive patients or uh, the high risk patients who were decompensated. The primary outcome was death or hemodynamic decompensation within seven days of randomization, but they also looked at some safety outcomes, including bleeding and intracranial bleeding. What they found was that the tenecteplase was superior to heparin alone in terms of preventing the primary composite outcome of all-cause mortality and collapse. However, the criticism of the PYTHO study are that the driver of this primary outcome was likely this more subjective component of, these, of the uh, hemodynamic collapse, and that is hypotension and blood pressure drop. This led to quite a bit of criticism as this is a very subjective uh, outcome that may have ultimately influenced the, the primary efficacy outcome that we're observing. In addition, there were some safety concerns in patients who received tenecteplase, they had about a 12-fold increased risk of stroke. Absolute numbers were low, but nonetheless, a 12-fold increased risk of stroke, with them predominantly being hemorrhagic stroke. In addition, about a four-fold increase in major non-intracranial hemorrhage bleeding. Important details, however, emerge from this data, and that patients who did have intracranial hemorrhage it was isolated in those patients over the age of 65, with eight out of 10 of those events occurring in patients over the age of 75. 
So patient, young patients tended to tolerate uh, the thrombolytics relatively well, at least based on this analysis, which is the most robust to date. So maybe we're giving too much thrombolytic. Maybe lower doses would work as well and be safer. And that's the idea behind the safe dose trial or the Moffitt study, which uh, randomized patients who had what they called moderate pulmonary embolism, a definition that we don't actually use today. Basically, these were actually a lower risk group. They, less than one in five had RVW ratio greater than one, less than one in 20 had RV dysfunction by echo, only about two thirds had elevated biomarkers. But by definition on, on echo, they had to have some pulmonary hypertension to be included. And the primary outcome was pulmonary hypertension at 28 months or pulmonary hypertension and recurrent PE. And they found that the reduced dose of lytic, which is a maximum of 50 milligrams or less based on a weight-based regimen, was efficacious at reducing their primary endpoint of pulmonary hypertension recurrent PE. Without an increase in terms of safety concerns, no, no, no significant differences of bleeding, and there were no observed intracranial hemorrhages, but also shorter hospital lengths of stay. But I, I caution uh, people in using this to interpret the safety of reduced dose lytics, although it has widely been adopted in most PERT programs, um, probably out of necessity. But I, I do think we need better evidence to support this um, to be broadly used uh, moving forward. And there's a number of investigations that are kind of on way or underway to look at this. But when we look at the totality of thrombolytic use in patients with PE, in terms of risk of all-cause mortality, major bleeding, intracranial hemorrhage, some important differences are shown. Now, this is, again, all studies to date, and that includes PITHO, as well as one of the catheter-directed uh, randomized studies was included. But the population from that group is relatively small and probably wouldn't affect the overall results here. But all-cause mortality was lower uh, in patients who received thrombolytics, but a fairly high number needed to treat of about 59 to prevent more mortality. But when you look at the major bleeding, only 18 to cause harm. So three major bleeds for every life saved, which doesn't uh, sound very appealing, especially when you're looking at all comers. When you break it down and look at those who are at higher risk, in this case, intermediate risk, Again, improvement in all-cause mortality, but a very high number needed to treat. Again, for every one survival or one mortality uh, prevented, three major bleeds. So again, not very appetizing. But again, this study confirms the findings from the high pytho that age may have some impact in terms of bleeding risk. And uh, generally patients under the age of 65, major bleeding uh, was not observed, or at least not different between the thrombolytic group and the heparin arms whereas over the age of 65, significantly more major bleeds in the thrombolytic arm. So this has led to the idea that perhaps um, we can minimize some of the bleeding concerns and safety concerns by maybe providing a different route or administration of thrombolytics directly into the clot, or even foregoing thrombolytics altogether using aspiration methods to remove clot burden. Now there's a number of approved devices now for direct treatment of PE that are FDA approved and on the market. And this is just some of the examples of the most common three. So why catheter-directed therapy? Well, when you have a occlusive, clot, occlusive thrombus in the pulmonary vasculature, flow is gonna be preferentially directed where there's less resistance. And with that flow, your drug is gonna follow. So systemic lytics will less likely get to the area of greatest concern and preferentially get to the areas of less concern and ultimately have more of a systemic effect than a local effect. Whereas with catheters, we can directly place the drug in direct contact with the clot, at least in greatest proximity to the clot, allowing for more focal targeted therapy with lower doses over a longer period of time that would have a better safety profile less invasive than surgery, and potentially allow earlier convalescence and maybe earlier discharge than with heparin alone. But there are disadvantages. It's added cost. These tools do require advanced skill sets and uh, equipment. The evidence remains limited. And low risk is not no risk. So we have to keep these things in context. The first randomized trial looking at utilizing ultrasound-assisted catheter-directed thrombolysis, or ECOS is what the brand is, or treatment of acute immune risk patients was uh, completed in 2014. Hypothesis was that catheter-directed therapy would be superior to heparin for reversing the right ventricular enlargement observed by echo or CT within 24 hours. Inclusion criteria was simply acute symptomatic PE with RV-LV ratio greater than one on echo, uh, 
And there were 60 patients randomized to treatment with catheter directed therapy and heparin versus heparin alone. And this is just uh, some graphical uh, or some pictures of uh, a large PE with ECOS catheters in place and post procedural findings with a completion of the angiogram. What they found is that the primary outcome, RVW ratio, there was significant uh, differences. ECOS did uh, provide for a more rapid reduction in right ventricular volumes or diameters within 24 hours compared to heparin alone. Although at 90 days, there was a catch-up phase for heparin. So ultimately, the heparin arm also did relatively well and right ventricle ended up uh, improving over time, but a much more immediate result with catheter-directed thrombolytics. And in terms of right ventricular dysfunction, ECOS provided a more rapid improvement in right ventricular function within 24 hours with continued improvement at 90 days, with most patients having normal RV function at 90 days, whereas in the heparin arm, there were greater degrees of right ventricular dysfunction that persisted at 24 hours and at 90 days. Importantly, no differences in bleeding outcomes in this population, but also no differences in survival, but it was a small study not powered for survival and would not be expected to be detected. Now, the Seattle 2 was a prospective non-randomized trial comparing the ultrasound-assisted thrombolytic catheters um, to the benchmark, which was the Ultima study. And they found they randomized 150 patients to receive catheter-directed thrombolysis. And importantly, in this study, this was a higher-risk population, that one in five were actually high-risk PE. They found similar effects with the Ultima trial, and that uh, immediate reduction in RVDLV diameter was significant within 48 hours significant reductions in PA systolic pressures, but also the modified Miller index was significantly improved with catheter-directed thrombolytics. And it did so at very little expense in terms of safety outcomes with an in-hospital and 30-day mortality that was very favorable. Again, remember, one in five of these patients presented with hypotension, shock, or syncope, or other high-risk features that would generally portend a much higher mortality rate, which was not observed in this study. And they did with low bleeding rates, severe gusto-related bleeding of less than 0.7%, no intracranial hemorrhages, and very low device-related or TPA-related serious adverse events. In a nationwide study uh, of over 13,000 patients with acute PE and right ventricular dysfunction, with up to 1,500 of them having received catheter-directed thrombolysis, which rep roughly reflects 11% compared to heparin alone, with propensity matching, found that uh, mortality did favor catheter-directed thrombolysis. And it didn't matter if it was saddle PE versus non-saddle PE. Mortality was lower with catheter-directed therapy. IBC filters did not provide any benefit in this population. And based on a time-dependent analysis, benefit is greatest within the first three days of hospitalization. And despite the use of thrombolytics, complication rates were very similar with heparin alone. Some patients, however, are not candidates for lytics in any form. And there are alternatives. The, uh, there's a number of aspiration catheters out there now. This is one form called the Flow Treaver. It has 510K approval based on the Flare IDE study. We were early, uh, we were in the run-in phase of the Flare study, but ultimately didn't participate in the actual trial. They, uh, ran, they treated 106 consecutive patients with intermediate risk PE with large bore suction catheters and found that within 48 hours, very favorable right ventricular remodeling uh, very quickly and comparable to that of the ultrasound-assisted thrombolytics at very low major adverse event rates. This study led to the 510K approval and adoption of this device and treatment of acute PE. We've used it here on a number of occasions where patients could not receive thrombolytics and that were uh, the PERT team determined would benefit from advanced therapies with really nice, uh, dramatic results in terms of clot extraction and ultimately recovery. So understanding that we have some limitations with our risk stratification tools in terms of their predictive abilities, we have various treatment options. How do, we, how do we determine when to apply these treatments to the various patient populations? Does everyone just receive heparin and wait and see, or do you selectively treat a few who meet certain risk stratifiers in hopes of preventing death or decompensation? Who decides and what treatment do you give? And I think that gets behind the, the role of the PERT team. So who are the experts? At the UW, the experts currently, as it, as it exists, is the CCU fellow on call, who is the first responder, interventional cardiology on call, and the critical care medicine uh, faculty via the EICU on call. Most PERT programs or PERT teams are comprised of at least two or more specialists, frequently three, 
with interests in PE management, not necessarily fixed specialties. Um, they generally should have the ability to exercise a full range of medical, surgical, or endovascular therapies to treat PE. If you've seen one PERT team, you've seen one PERT team. There's a number of variations in team composition. It really depends on the resources available at each center. The majority of PERT programs are in large academic centers. However, up to a third are in community-based programs. And the PERT is actually based on uh, an existing model that has been used for quite some time. Many of you are very aware of what the rapid response teams are. Rapid response team concept was supported and endorsed by the Institute for Healthcare Improvements Protecting 5 Million Lives campaign. The idea that we can improve hospital outcomes by preventing arrests or non-ICU arrests before they happen and maybe even impact mortality. Now, I guess it depends on who you asked, how successful rapid response teams have been, but, but ultimately they have been successful and they've been widely adopted uh, actually worldwide and continue to be quite common today. The mechanism is identify at risk patients, have an early notification process for the team activation, rapid intervention by that team, and then an audit of the, scene of the system's performance. An analogous to this is the PERT team. We have a rapid activation pathway for a PE first responder, in our case, the CCU fellow as it currently exists, a real-time collaboration uh, pathway via a conference line to engage the multiple specialists as well as the CCU fellow to discuss the patients, this facilitates real-time cooperation and patient management and a cognitive interchange to promote a consensus opinion. This allows a rapid and fairly accurate risk stratification of patients to understand the limitations of the tools uh, that we have. It introduces that human element that I think is very important when you have limitations such as, as our current risk stratifiers. And it endorses or forces us to develop a treatment algorithm that promotes a standard of care so that we can try to keep some some standard and not just a, a more of a willy-nilly approach. It provides guidance on the management of acute pulmonary embolism and allows us to support tracking outcomes and be involved in evidence-based research. There's a lot of debate as to, do we really need PERT teams? And I think, uh, I think that's a fair criticism, but I think we do. And I, the reason why I think so is because our evidence base is very incomplete. AHA guidelines are based on level B and C evidence very limited random, randomized evidence, a lot of observational data, and all the guidelines use the same data. So very limited evidence, so it's very incomplete. Tools for risk stratification remain severely limited. They have great sensitivity, but low specificity. Positive predictive values are low. So it forces us to interpret it with care. And I think having specialists involved in that discussion is important. And depending on where the PE presents, there's a great deal of practice variation. A lot of it's specialty driven, some of it's patient demographics, some of it's the presence of large clot burn or other risk factors that ultimately influence decisions, and we need a standardized approach. So having a standard algorithm for care is, is important and the PERT team to enable that. And it allows for more systematic evaluation of outcomes. So then when we have this, who decides to intervene, which modality, and what is the endpoint that we're interested in? So here at the UW, we, um, uh, a group of uh, multiple specialists came together to create a algorithm or a flow diagram for a management of acute PE here at the UW. And this algorithm looks very similar with some subtle differences to other major PERT program algorithms across the country. And it was created with the PERT consortium's uh, algorithm in mind. And this is what we've established and how we approach every patient with PE that we are consulted for. Essentially, we try to categorize them as either high risk, intermediate risk, or low risk. Obviously, high risk, it's a very a fairly quick and easy decision tree. And of course, low risk patients tend to do very well. And it's more a discussion of can it be treated as an outpatient, just anticoagulation alone. Most of the time, the discussion is actually reviewing these patients in the intermediate risk category, because these are the ones that I think we have the greatest debate about how best to manage. So we try to actually risk stratify this population even further by identifying known uh, risk stratifiers such as the PESI index, degree of right ventricular dysfunction, at presence of biomarkers to identify them as either low intermediate risk or high intermediate risk. Low intermediate risk patients tend to have very good outcomes and anticoagulation alone with a brief period of in-hospital monitoring is most appropriate. However, these high intermediate risk patients are the ones that we are most concerned about, and more diligent about monitoring. And if they come in with certain clinical variables that we think make them at particularly higher risk, 
we're more prone to think about advanced therapies in this population. And these are the features that we look at. Uh, hypoxemia requiring at least four years of nasal cannula, uh, tachycardia, or even mildly low blood pressure. We call these unstable high risk. And these are the ones that we're thinking hard about giving advanced treatment options. So what has the effect of PER programs been uh, on outcomes? Well, at MGH, with this 10-year analysis, uh, they found that it improves risk stratification. More low-risk patients are actually appropriately classified as intermediate risk. High risk tended to be fairly consistent. But it also led to more use of advanced therapies, either catheter-directed or, throm or even uh, thrombolytics or, or some combination thereof. Cleveland Clinic, which has a, a large experience, identified that in their post-PERT era, a significant improvement in terms of early initiation of IV anticoagulation. While there was a trend towards use of more advanced therapies, they found that there's a significant reduction in IVC filter use, which is a, a major issue to today, but also a significant reduction in major and clinically relevant non-major bleeding, as well as a 48% reduction in 30-day and inpatient mortality in patients who present with high-risk PE. Other centers, such as MGH, also found a significantly more advanced therapies but no differences in major bleeding or survival, but fewer PE-related admissions, whereas the University of Virginia found improved survival, but no differences in bleeding, length of stay, or cost, despite more advanced therapy use. Impact on length of stay may be relevant, too, uh, with improved risk stratification, but also greater adoption of advanced therapies found that ICU length of stay tends to be lower in the post-PERT era, at uh, several, at many centers that, that adopt a formal PERT algorithm. And there tends to be favorable impacts in terms of overall resident fellow education as well. And this uh, physician survey of at least seven different specialists or specialty uh, training programs found that uh, pa patient care was improved in high-risk PE patients about 90% of the time, uh, or I should say 90% agreed that patient care has improved for high-risk PE. Uh, over 80% uh, confirmed that there is a positive impact on their education. Over 70% agree that knowledge base has increased. Most would agree that every hospital should have a high-risk PE program, as well as have greater awareness of high-risk PE without much compromise in terms of overall autonomy. And based on Likert ratings, pre and post-PERT, uh, most were more likely to identify high-risk PE patients, be better uh, prepare to manage high-risk patients, as well as understand indications for thrombolytic use or surgical embolectomy. What's the future for PE care? I think it's bright. I think uh, because of the intense interest that has been enabled by this cooperation of the nonprofit organization, the PERT Consortium, which now has over 100 different institutions that's worldwide and over 1,400 different international members, with the mission of advancing status of PE care and promoting advances in research, I think the future can be very bright. The PERT registry is actually maintained by the PERT consortium. All, uh, any center can participate that wants to enter their data, can also retrieve data for the purpose of outcomes research. Monthly uh, uh, updates and webcasts are, are provided online for ongoing education without a uh, cost of membership. And monthly meetings for research, education, and protocol committees are held uh, regularly, which are also uh, for members only, but uh, essentially membership is free and anybody can pr and, uh, participate with these committees. And because of this per consortium and the cooperation of all these facilities, as well as un unrestricted grants from industry, that's enabled the initiation of this multi-center and national trial consortium and the production of a number of, of high quality randomized trials that are gonna look at real clinical endpoints we're using advanced therapies and treatment of PE, including high pytho, which we've recently been selected as a site, the only site in Wisconsin, I think the only site in the Midwest to participate. And this is a randomized comparison of ultrasound facilitated catheter-directed thrombolytics versus heparin in patients who are high intermediate risk of PE. Uh, the primary outcome measure will be PE-related mortality, cardiopulmonary decompensation arrest, and recurrent PE. Uh, I hope that we start enrolling within a matter of a couple of weeks, as it appears we're very close to the end of our, our contractual negotiations. And I'm very excited for the outcome of this trial, because I think this is long needed in terms of getting real clinical endpoints uh, to help us understand better who to treat and maybe how to treat these patients who are high intermediate risk. Uh, 
So in summary, uh, PERT teams and protocols standardize approach to PE risk stratification management and can lead to improved outcomes. Risk stratification tools are far from precise and further work is needed. Early anticoagulation remains the most important upfront therapy. Catheter-based therapy expands our ability to safely treat at-risk PE, while systemic TPA remains an important option for some patients. Future randomized trials will shed the light on future role of new advanced therapies. With that, I can take questions or I have a little bit of time. I'd like to go through a couple cases. These are real PERT cases that we actually have completed here at our institution. It might kind of give you a little bit of understanding of how our PERT operates. Okay. This was a, I'm sorry? I was gonna say you have time to run a couple cases if you want. Okay, thank you. So this was a 75 year old woman with a mild history of COPD who presented with severe onset dyspnea, near syncope and weakness. She had no recent uh, issues or concerns for potential bleeding risks, such as recent stroke, recent major surgeries, or a, a, any history of bleeding diathesis. She presented normal tensive with a normal heart rate and only borderline tachypnea, but requiring uh, BiPAP with uh, high oxygen content for maintaining saturations over 90%, as well as elevated biomarkers, both troponin and BMP, with this ECG showing uh, heart rate about 90, but significant for diffuse T wave inversions. She underwent CT scan, which demonstrated a large central thrombus burden in both right and left main branches. An urgent bedside echo demonstrated severe right ventricular dysfunction with a, a severe hypokinesis of the basal mid anterior wall and the classic McConnell sign and underfilling of the left ventricle. So this patient underwent a formal PERT assessment with the PERT team. In evaluating her, we found that she was normal tensive, so she was not high risk, but she did have RVW ratio dilatation with evidence right ventricular dysfunction and biomarker positive, so clearly not low risk. So she landed in the intermediate risk group. And since she did have all three parameters, was high intermediate risk. And given her high oxygen needs, as well as her near syncopal status, we determined her to be unstable high intermediate risk. And we ultimately decided that for her, given that her age is greater than 75, we strongly preferred not to give her systemic thrombolytics and elected for a catheter-directed approach. This is her uh, invasive pulmonary angiogram at the time of her cath, which demonstrates severe obstructive disease of the right upper lobe with real absence of perfusion, as well as severe obstructive disease of the interlobar vessel into the right lower lobe and severe obstruction of the lingula in the middle lobe of the left lung. After receiving uh, about 20 milligrams of slow infusion of TPA directly into the clot using ECOS, you can see a marked reduction in perfusion of the upper lobe as well as the middle lobe and all other lobes as well. A small amount of clot burn that is non-obstructive or not flow limiting. Within 10 hours, she was off of her BiPAP, asymptomatic on Lumaire. Her cardiac output by direct FIC measurement had uh, nearly doubled and her PA pressures had uh, reduced considerably. And she ultimately was discharged within a three-day hospital stay with, no with a normal right ventricle. This is a 31-year-old woman who recently presented with severe sudden onset shortness of breath and near syncope. You can, uh, she had a history of a developmental delay and, and seizure disorder, but no prior history of VTE or bleeding. She was tachycardic, she was tachypnic, but normal tensive. Uh, she was requiring high flow oxygen to maintain saturations. And concerning, she was thrombocytopenic for unknown reasons, mildly anemic as she was in her menses, but positive biomarkers, both BMP and troponin and an elevated uh, lactate. She had a large central clot burn that was nearly completely obstructed to the left lobe and severely obstructed to the right. She had significant right ventricular to, uh, LV dilatation with an RVW ratio of 1.5 or greater. Her echo showed some concerning features. She had severe right ventricular dilatation, severe dysfunction, classic McConnell sign, a compressed and underfilled left ventricle, and a large clot in transit. Clots in transit with this right ventricular performance and that clot burden in their lungs carry with it a very high mortality. The PERT, program, PERT team was convened and ultimately, uh, with serial discussions, elected that she was high intermediate risk, unstable, and we elected 
to perform catheter-directed thrombectomy and not thrombolytics despite her young age because of her low platelet count and mild anemia and history of seizure disorder. We took her to the cath lab and performed an aspiration thrombectomy of the right atrial clot in transit, but also bilateral pulmonary artery uh, thrombus with an excellent clinical result. And within 48 hours, her, her procedure was on a Friday, the echo was repeated on a Monday, significant decompensate or decompression of the right ventricle, uh, removal of the right atrial clot in transit, and improved filling of the left ventricle. Her clinical course uh, continues to to evolve, but she's doing quite well. So with that, I could take some questions or some feedback. I'd love to hear thoughts from the audience at this point. Dr. Jacobson, thank you for the excellent talk and congratulations on the success of your program. We have several questions and we're gonna go through these. Uh, first, is there value in identifying circulating blood components? Is there value in identifying circulating blood components? I guess I might need more perspective on that. Um, maybe, uh, I guess we just don't know. Uh, we just need the evidence to show that. There may be risk tools that, that as serum markers that are more predictive. Uh, again, the only ones that I'm aware of are the cardiac biomarkers, which are commonly obtained in emergency rooms when evaluating patients with chest pain and shortness of breath. But there may be others, and I am unaware of what they are at this point. Thank you, Kurt. The next question is, do per teams undergo specific teamwork training, either locally or as a national standard? And at any given year, how many basically members are part of the team trying to assess, uh, I guess, the, the burden for training uh, the team? Right, right. so that's, that's, a, that's a really a very good point. And I, I imagine there's a great deal of variability across the nation. Most programs uh, are, in, at least in community centers, exist to the same specialists. So there's probably not much in training, but in academic centers where we include learners in the program, such as in this case, CCU fellows, I do perform an annual um, didactic to go over the algorithms and the evidence behind it, very similar to this talk with the fellows, especially the first year fellows who are coming in, who are being trained. And I do that for all fellows that are interested in the past, that's included TLC, IR fellows, critical care, surgery fellows, et cetera. So there is some, there is some formal training. Uh, I think it could be improved. I think there could be simulation-based training scenarios similar to what we do with um, hospital arrests or code teams uh, or shock teams. I think there's definitely room for improvement and simulation would have a big role in that. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, amazing talk. Can you discuss whether there is a risk of reperfusion lung injury with catheter-based aspiration and or thrombolysis? That's something I've been concerned about a number of times, especially with severely obstructive uh, clot burden where there's no perfusion. Uh, I've been very concerned about it, and it has been reported. But fortunately, at our institution, we have not observed this yet, or at least I'm not aware of any cases where we've reperfused and had reperfusion injury. Again, great talk. Can you please comment on how lack of bed availability in the ICU generally <laughs> has impacted PE management at our institution? And do all intermediate high or high risk PEs need to come to a tertiary care center? Uh, that's, that's controversial. The latter half of that question is very controversial. Uh, I, I, I'm biased to think that anybody who has an intermediate or high risk PE probably would warrant uh, escalation of care to a, a facility that has all the resources to treat someone who's at risk of decompensation. The problem is if they're at a center that doesn't have those resources and they do decompensate, the outcomes are quite grim. Whereas you're right, the mass majority will do well with conservative management and probably uh, not require advanced care. But when you do need it and you don't have it, that's when you're going to feel it the most. Now, the bed issue remains a concern for all of our programs. Uh, this is these are un, these are never before seen times with the pandemic and beds are extremely tight, and we see that affecting a number of our programs. And the PERT program is no exception. And this is going to be our last question since we have one minute left. How far out from acute PE are you able to perform cath-directed therapies? So the evidence would suggest that uh, the best results are within 14 at least as best we can determine within 14 days of the index embolus. The farther it gets out, the less complete result there will be, but it's not to say that the result can't be beneficial 
Beyond 14 days, it's less known and probably greater risk of uh, suboptimal results, and therefore your risks are amplified. So I would say it's best when they come in within 14 days of the initial symptom onset. Dr. Jacobson, thank you again for the excellent talk and thank you all for joining and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.